Westminster Abbey is about to be at the heart of a ceremony that hasn't happened for 70 years, one that defines the reign of a monarch, the coronation. But what do people here in Westminster think of when they think of a coronation? It's when the new king comes into power. Kingdom, kings and queens. Uh, the queen. When do you think would have been the earliest coronation in England? The earliest coronation? Uh... I Maybe in the... 1100s, uh, I don't know. 1600s? 600 years ago. The first record of the consecration of a king in Great Britain was in 574. 574? I was wrong by 600 years, that's okay. <laughs> it's not far. In May 2023, Charles III will be acknowledged, anointed and crowned as King of the United Kingdom at Westminster Abbey in a ceremony that appears to be full of ancient traditions. I'm going to explore just how old the origins of this moment of pomp and pageantry really are. How far back can we trace the coronation service? What does it mean? And what's really going on in some of its key moments? The first record of the consecration of a king in the British Isles is that of King Aidan, who was king of Dalriada, a kingdom that covered Western Scotland and Northeastern Ireland. And that took place in the year 574. But what exactly are the constituent parts of a coronation ceremony that we'll see today? The Anglo-Saxons began to come over to Britain after the Roman Empire left. From the 5th to the 11th century, what is now England emerged from a patchwork of smaller kingdoms created by incoming Angles, Saxons and Jutes from Germanic regions. We know that they had coronations, but we don't know too much about them. Anglo-Saxon coronations were really poorly recorded. We don't even know for sure where they all took place. Some were at Kingston-on-Thames, and we know that King Edgar at the end of the 10th century chose to be crowned in Bath. But the crown that they used was retained for centuries. It was named after Edward the Confessor and is first referred to as St Edward's crown at the coronation of Henry III in 1220. It survived until the Civil War saw the destruction of the royal regalia. A new crown had to be made for Charles II and what we see now is a version of St Edward's crown made in 1661. Crowns aren't the only part of the modern ceremony that retains elements from the Anglo-Saxon period. A key remnant from Anglo-Saxon coronations is known as the recognition. It comes at the beginning of the coronation and is the election of a monarch. It's a bit of a legal fiction, really. It's a hangover from an Anglo-Saxon world in which kings were elected. A council of the great and good of the kingdom known as the Wittenengamot, or the Witten for short, would select the next king from a pool of suitable candidates. They were the men you needed to be in with if you wanted to be the next Anglo-Saxon king of England. If a coronation is something like a wedding ceremony, this is the part of the service where the vicar asks whether anyone has any objections to the match going ahead. Of course, no one's ever been brave enough to actually have an objection. The earliest surviving order that we have for an English coronation, the list of instructions for the service, looks remarkably familiar, but it comes from the 9th century. It's 1,200 years old. It details prayers and blessings to be said for the king. He's anointed with oil. He's given a staff and a helmet that marks him as part holy man and part warrior to defend his people. And then he has to promise to rule justly and to take care of the people now under his control. In an 11th century order, that promise is moved to the beginning of the ceremony, so he has to promise to rule justly and protect his people before he's allowed to be crowned. I'm heading to Kingston-upon-Thames, just to the south of London, 
to look at what claims to be a key part of Anglo-Saxon coronation ceremonies. We know that between about 900 and 1016, half a dozen or so Anglo-Saxon kings were crowned here at Kingston-upon-Thames. Hopefully the weather held out for them a bit more than it has for us today. Legend has it too that this stone played a central part in those coronation ceremonies. There are some claims that it came from the original Saxon church that was used for the coronations, but like lots of those local legends, we'll never really know. This royal connection gave Kingston its name. Even the name of this place commemorates that connection. King's Tun doesn't mean King's Stone. A tun was an Anglo-Saxon word for a settlement or a farmstead, so it means something more like King's Town. Stones seem to play important roles in British coronation traditions. Kingston uses the coronation stone to mark the Anglo-Saxon ceremonies held here. The Stone of Schoon, or the Stone of Destiny, was a flat rectangle of stone on which Scottish kings were seated to be crowned. In 1296, it was taken by force by Edward I to England and placed beneath the coronation chair he commissioned to house it. Although it was returned to Scotland in 1996, it will be back in London for King Charles's coronation and he'll be the 30th monarch in a row to be crowned in that chair with the Stone of Schoon beneath him. The association of stones plays into the idea of the permanence of the crown, not just as worn by an individual, but as an institution that stands the test of time. For all the symbolism of endurance, Anglo-Saxon England's days were numbered. In one fateful year, two armies would invade to try and take the crown. The Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of England would come crashing down in 1066. Harold Godwinson was crowned at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of January. On the 25th of September, Harold defeated an invading Norwegian army in the north at the Battle of Stamford Bridge that sought to return England to Viking rule. On the 14th of October, he faced a Norman assault on the south coast and lost his life at the Battle of Hastings. He was killed by the forces of William, Duke of Normandy. But killing King Harold didn't make William King of England. He needed to be elected and accepted as ruler. Here, he hit a problem. The Anglo-Saxon Witten had already chosen a candidate of their own, Edgar Etheling, as their new leader. William proved too powerful for the Witten to make their choice stick, though. The second coronation of 1066 was that of William the Conqueror on Christmas Day. Elective kingship in England was over. Or was it? In the aftermath of the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror was in a bit of a pickle. How do you become King of England? How do you get the crown? Dukes of Normandy didn't know they weren't kings. Instead, William had to rely on those left over in the Anglo-Saxon establishment to teach him. And William's reign would start with his coronation in a baptism of fire, literally. The abbey was packed with the great and good of Anglo-Saxon England and the Norman aristocracy. Aeldred, Archbishop of York, was performing the ceremony. Because William was relying on an old Anglo-Saxon order of service that required the election of the monarch, those within the abbey were asked whether they accepted William to be their new ruler. The Anglo-Saxons and the Normans were desperately trying to outdo each other in acclaiming William as their new king. One chronicler says that they all spoke in one voice, if not in one language. The Anglo-Saxons and the Norman voices grew louder and louder with every breath. Outside in the streets, the guards reacted badly to the noise that was coming from the abbey. They set fire to all of the surrounding buildings, fearing that something was kicking off at the coronation. As the abbey began to fill with smoke, the nobility poured out to be greeted with a Westminster engulfed in flames. Inside the abbey, a few clergymen remained, alone with the king, who was determined 
to finish his coronation. Imagine the scene, Westminster was in chaos, buildings were ablaze, the abbey is engulfed in smoke, people are running through the streets, most of them trying to put out all of these fires, but some, the chroniclers tell us, making the most of the chaos and falling to pillaging. And all the while, inside there, William is waiting, determined that he will be king. Even after the chaos of 1066, the idea that some part of the coronation ceremony involved an election endured. It had been that moment of asking for assent of those within the Abbey to William's kingship that had sparked all of the troubles. And yet it proved impossible to shake from the coronation ceremony. Even now, nearly a thousand years later, Charles will still be presented to the crowd within Westminster Abbey who are asked for approval before the next key stage, the oath. I'm meeting historian George Gross to find out more about this part of the ceremony. So what are the, the core elements of the oath? The three central elements are to rule by the laws, the customs. Two is justice and mercy. And this is important because the monarch is the chief judge of all. Um, even to this day, judges are his majesty's judges. So they, it follows down from your pyramid of, of power. So the other is justice with mercy. So it's not just handing out law, it's doing it in a merciful, kind, kingly way. And the third is religion. And all three parts are still firmly within the oath, modified of course, but they're still there. And how different is an oath that we might see during a, a coronation today, a more recent coronation? I think we should think of oaths in, we've got to try and think of how important that was with Edward the Confessor, William the Conqueror, the Bayer Tapestry, um, Harold breaking an oath. It's, this is a world where oaths matter. In the medieval, it's rooted in a tradition where the oath really matters. And of course, in coronations, when a monarch goes wrong, the people represented by nobles have often gone back to the oath and said, hang on, you've broken your coronation oath. You've broken those vows. You've breached the contract. Breached the contract. So the monarch has been elected, taken the oath, and the next stage is perhaps the single most critical, the anointing. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.